Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to Leo Beck Institute at the Center for Jewish History. My name is David Brown. I'm director of uh, communications and programming here at Leo Beck Institute. Um, and I'm really grateful that you all uh, came out for this event tonight because it's a very important subject to Leo Beck Institute and we're happy that you're here to celebrate uh, both the Aufbau uh, and Peter Schrag's great new book. Um, I think that this is probably, uh, if, if any event appeals to LBI's core audience, our, our most loyal uh, supporters, uh, it would be this one. So before I launch into a long-winded explanation of the LBI and the center, has anyone, uh, is anyone here at the Center for Jewish History for the first time tonight? Oh, we have a few people. Okay, great. So uh, thank you for coming. I hope you come back. Uh, very briefly, the Center for Jewish History uh, consists of uh, five partner organizations um, that really, uh, who have collections and uh, programmatic activities that encompass um, all of Jewish history. Um, and uh, Leo Beck Institute is focused on the history of the German-speaking Jews and we have a very large library, archival collection, and art collection. Um, and tonight we're focused on the library collection uh, with one of our um, sort of uh, premier periodicals. Um, you will also find in this building the collections of YIVO, Institute for Jewish Research, focused on uh, Yiddish language and Eastern European Jewry, American Sephardi Federation, uh, and American Jewish Historical Society. And I think the, the name says it all there. Um, and we also have um, in the building Yeshiva University Museum. Um, so again, thank you for coming and I hope you got a chance to look at some of our upcoming programs. Uh, if not, uh, pick up a calendar on your way out of the, the exciting programs coming up this fall at the Center for Jewish History, uh, including LBI and all the partners. Um, I'm actually here tonight filling in uh, on short notice for our executive director, Billy Weitzer. Uh, like I said, this is a really important event for us and he, uh, it's Im important enough that he planned to uh, come straight from off the plane from Germany to make this presentation, but he got stuck in Amsterdam. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but uh, really we're here to see our, our panelists tonight uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce them. I'm gonna introduce them now and then uh, make just like a 10 minute uh, presentation on the Aufbau at LBI. Um, uh, but before we do that, um, we're here tonight uh, for, for Peter Schrag, who wrote the, the book, The World of Aufbau, um, which is gonna be for sale after the event, $30, which is a, a, a discount off the cover price and you could get it signed. Uh, so see me afterward for that. Um, Peter is a journalist, author, and educator based in Davis, California. He was formerly the editorial page editor of the Sacramento Bee, so a, a newspaper man in, in more ways than one, uh, and a longtime contributor to The Nation magazine. He's a former Guggenheim fellow who's written a number of books, uh, including Paradise Lost, California's Experience, America's Future, which was a New York Times notable book in 1998, and um, uh, more recently, when Europe Was a Prison Camp, Father and Son Memoirs, 1940 to 41, uh, which we were lucky to be able to present here at Leo Beck Institute a few years ago uh, with uh, Marianne Kaplan, who's also in the audience tonight. Um, uh, providing uh, some more context about the American Jewish experience uh, into which the German Jewish refugees that published and read the Aufbau came is Shira Kohn, who is a member of the upper school history faculty at the Dalton School. She received her doctorate in history and Hebrew and Judaic studies from New York University and is currently working on a monograph focusing on Jewish college sororities and civil rights in post-war post America. Um, along with Hasia Diener and Rachel Cranston, she co-edited A Jewish Feminine Mystique, Jewish Women in Post-War America. Um, and she recently published an article on Jew German Jewish student refugees in 1930s America, um, which I, I believe uh, she did research for that, uh, for that work here at the Center for Jewish History. Um, so it's a pleasure to have her back um, on stage. Uh, and tonight we'll also have uh, Werner Gundersheimer, uh, 
a historian, educator, and the director emeritus of the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's also a trustee of Leo Beck Institute, and he's going to moderate the discussion tonight. So like, like I said, I hope you'll just indulge uh, us in, in, a, in just a 10-minute overview of what the, what the Aufbau means to Leo Beck Institute. Um, you're you're going to hear a really uh, deeply informed discussion with Peter, Werner, and Shira about the Aufbau itself and its role in the German refugee community. Um, but it's also one of the most important holdings in Leo Beck Institute collections. Uh, its prominence goes far beyond the 24 linear feet of shelf space that it takes up in our stacks up on the 12th floor. And you can see what that looks like here. That's the Aufbau, uh, just a few feet of it. Um, in custom, custom enclosures that protect the physical newspapers. Um, and what Elfbau provides is, is a kind of um, a, a narrative glue or, a, or context, really, for all the rest of our collections um, uh, from, the, from the 1930s uh, on. Uh, it was the main way that the community of German Jewish refugees that built the LBI in New York uh, communicated with one another and maintained their group identity. And it gives context, context to the experience related in all of the memoirs and letters and archival collections of German Jewish refugees uh, that we have here, which often explicitly refer to the Aufbau um, and the different roles that it played in people's lives. Uh, it also provides a unique window on how that community processed nearly seven decades of 20th century history, from its first issue as a newsletter celebrating the 10th anniversary of the New World Club in 1934, which you can see here, uh, to its final printing almost 3,000 issues later in 2004. And like any newspaper, it reflects major world and local events. Um, here's just a smattering. We can see how the Aufbau reported on the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, the Vietnam War, and the Kennedy assassination. Um, but it also reflects the particular concerns of its readership and its publishers, um, especially in its abiding coverage of the young nation of Israel and its development. Um, uh, as you can see here in what's, uh, I think, a relatively rare full-page image on the front cover uh, with, that's uh, sort of captioned, Guardian of the New Palestine. This is from 1948. Um, and the other uh, uh, sort of focus of the Aufbau uh, is that it probably offered some of the most thorough coverage of affairs in Germany published in the United States, not only for matters that might uh, be narrowly construed as Jewish concerns, like the trials of uh, Nazi war criminals or the struggle for reparations and restitution, but also just German politics and culture writ large. And you can see here a uh, discussion of the division of Germany after uh, World War II. But what's most important to LBI is the role that Aufbau played in the emigration and integration process of the German Jewish refugees, uh, which is a topic that Peter's book describes really masterfully. Um, and just here's just a sort of tour of highlights from the Aufbau of the, and it, what it did for German Jewish refugees. You can also see um, uh, Lauren Paustian from our uh, library staff uh, has blown up and printed a number of pages and put them on poster board. Uh, and you can take a look at those outside um, uh, and get kind of a tactile feel for the Aufbau. But um, the, here's an example of how German Jews retained old customs while adopting new ones. This is an ad for a soccer match juxtaposed next to an article about basketball. And in the 1930s and 40s, a lively soccer culture was supported in New York City um, by immigrants from all over. Europe, but especially Jewish refugees from Germany. And um, the Aufbau was one of the places you could read about it. And I believe the New World Club also had a team. Um, we can learn about how their entertainments and leisure time settled into the American landscape, um, ads for Catskills resorts that catered to Jews uh, from New York City are a constant in the Aufbau. And we can also learn how German Jews embraced their civic role in American life. and. Uh, a in really interesting aspect to me is when you look at the way that advertisers or uh, politicians recognized German Jewish refugees as a cohesive interest group or, or consumer segment 
Um, so here you can see the liberal Republican senator, Jacob Javits, courting the votes of German Jews with an appeal to the tradition of Brandeis and Lincoln for human rights and progress. Um, and I know that our panel, um, especially Shira, is going to talk about the rich opportunity for additional scholarship based on the Aufbau. But as a library in the digital age, um, LBI's mission is also evolving uh, to include curating sources like the Aufbau, trying to surface them for people uh, in a way that inspires them to, to look further and do their, res their own research. Um, and one example of the way that we've done that uh, was the 1938 project, uh, wh where throughout 2018, we published every day a document from our archives, a letter, uh, an entry in a diary, um, or in many cases, um, something from the Aufbau uh, from the corresponding day in 1938. Um, so here you can see how the Aufbau covered the Munich Agreement and the annexation of the Sudetenland. Uh, this was published in November 1938 before Kristallnacht, and uh, it's an editorial that forcefully decries the abject failures of the, of, uh, the heads of state of the, so, of the quote, so-called democracies. Um, who were failing to deal with the threat of Nazism. The Aufbau is also an incredible resource for genealogists, and this is um, one of the ways that we interact with uh, researchers from all over the world, um, uh, genealogists, and, and also historians who want to piece together individual narratives uh, of the refugee experience. So this is very typical of the pages and pages of the paper in the 1940s that was devoted to ads um, like these placed, for, placed by Jewish refugees uh, searching for lost relatives. And if you look closely at this one, um, this is an ad placed by relatives of Anne Frank who uh, knew that her mother Edith had been killed in Birkenau but didn't yet know Anne's fate and were trying to locate her. Um, and a number of volunteers did incredible work over the years with the Aufbau indexing project, um, building an index of personal names in, in that kind of listings, as well as marriage, birth, and death announcements. Um, uh, but one of, the, one of the things that we're really proud of um, at LBI uh, is the fact that the entire Aufbau is now available uh, online. We've digitized it, and it's been available since 2013 uh, at, ar at archive.org. Um, and here you can see our staff taking some of the over 20,000 images of Aufbau online. And um, LBI did this work uh, o over years with significant support from the Metropolitan New York Library Council. And I just want to acknowledge the members of our staff who are here who um, really put untold amounts of effort into making this resource available um, for anyone in the world to use. Uh, Renata Evers, the head of our library, is here. Lauren Paustian, I believe, is also here. Um, Michael Simonson, who works with researchers all the time uh, who are doing research on the Aufbau. And pardon, forgive me if I'm missing anyone else. Um, and here's an example of the kind of research that is made easier by digitization. So recently, one of our staff members uh, on the development team, Stephen Goldberg, wanted to confirm a story that he had heard about members of his family who left the Ferramonti concentration camp uh, in Italy for Palestine in 1944. And by taking advantage of the full text search capabilities using his grandfather's name, Wolf Ober, uh, we were able to quickly point him to the article listing all the passengers aboard that ship, including his grandfather, his aunt Clara, and the man that Clara was traveling with, a uh, prospective husband um, although the marriage never came to be. And then we're going to see, there he is, Wolf Ober. Um, uh, we also have a lot of collections that augment the Aufbau, including the, um, uh, the archival collection of uh, Manfred George, pictured here, who was the edit editor-in-chief for many years and really sort of professionalized the paper. And we also recently received and processed the papers of Lilo Goldenberg, um, who was married to the longtime Aufbau president Norbert Goldenberg. Uh, she was born in Berlin, left for New York in 1937, 
and was hired as a secretary at the Aufbau, uh, where she met her future husband Norbert, a physician who was the president of the German Jewish Club that published the paper. And um, this collection is rich in materials about both Lilo and Norbert's families in Germany and the social and intellectual life surrounding the Aufbau in New York. Uh, Lilo passed away in 2017, um, but uh, we were honored to meet her when she came to visit us earlier that year, and we're very pleased to welcome members of her family in the audience tonight, I believe. Um, so we're very proud to be the custodians of this, research, of this resource, and I'm just going to leave you, uh, well, of this resource that was a kind of uh, Heimat for, for the German Jewish refugees, and just on the note of Heimat, I'm going to leave you with a slide that sort of drives that home, something from our 1938 project, very typical ad from the Aufbau. Finally, what you've been craving, real, genuine, good German sausage. Um, so if, if that's what you were looking for, the Aufbau was the place to find it. Um, and uh, now I'm going to invite our, our panelists up to, to tell us more about it. So thank you. I, I turned around. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The format we've agreed upon for this evening is for each of our two panelists to speak for about 10 minutes, after which they will engage in discussion with each other for about 20 minutes. And then we're going to throw it open for questions, discussion, um, whatever is on your minds. And they will uh, try, along with me, to respond. So the first speaker is the wonderful author of this quite extraordinary book, Peter Schrag. Thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me, first of all? Uh, tomatoes? <laughs> OK, how, can you hear me now? A little more. A little more? Where's our? Shall we crank you up a little? I don't, yeah, I don't know how I crank this up. I think he can do it from up. He can do it from upstairs. Can, OK, you're good now. OK, all right. Well, thank you for coming. And I, I hope you enjoyed the speech. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being a little bit too facetious. Anyway, um, uh, let me first say one thing about my work and at the Leo Beck Institute. Not, this book could not, could not exist without the Leo Beck Institute, uh, because it would have been impossible for me to do the research if it had not been digitized. And, 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 um, and, but also, uh, LBI uh, has so many archives and so many documents and letters and memoirs um, that it was, great, it was a great resource to fill in other things. Um, so I, I'm really grateful to LBI and, and, and as, a, as an institution that preserves as much as possible uh, the history of this generation of immigrants and refugees. Um, the, uh, 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 I should also say that um, I have a number of friends and relatives here to whom I'm also grateful. Uh, my cousin Raymond is on the board of the Leo Beck Institute, uh, as is Werner Gundersheimer. And I've known Werner actually probably longer than I've known anybody uh, in my professional life. I first met him when he was a student at Amherst, and he worked in my office and began uh, his career as a brilliant sports writer. Um, the, uh, 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 but, but then, uh, way led on the way, and he became something else. And so uh, he, he, the, the sports writing world lost a great talent. Anyway, um, uh, uh, I, I should also say that um, when I first met him, I first worked with him in my office, and he was a student then, he didn't know that I was a refugee like him. And I worked very hard at that point to conceal it. I was very successful at concealing my refugee background. 
I wanted to have nothing to do with Germany, with German, with, uh, of course, this is right after the war. Um, but uh, like many immigrants, I wanted to work very hard to be American and nothing else uh, at that time. Um, and I avoided it for many years. But as a journalist, uh, writing over now more and more over the last 30 years about immigration, American immigration history, and immigration politics, uh, it was unavoidable that I came back to it um, and to my own history, my own background, my own experience um, as, a, as a refugee uh, who narrowly escaped uh, Germany and Europe uh, in 1940, 41. Um, the, um, um, uh, and, and, and so I, be, I, 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 I was forced, in a way, to confront that whole history uh, of my own. Um, and I first did a book uh, w with which LBI also was a great help. Um, uh, I had found, my father had, when, he, when we first came to the United States, in 1941, my father had written a memoir about his uh, internment in France as an alien uh, in southern France at a, at a French uh, internment camp uh, in Saint-Cyprien, uh, which actually is on the West Mediterranean coast. Um, and um, and he, he wrote this very long uh, memoir about the internment, his escape uh, with my mother's help, uh, and in the meantime, and also uh, some, uh, some material about my, my and my mother's escape from occupied Brussels uh, in 1940-41. Um, and so, uh, and in the meantime, I'd written a shorter memoir for my kids about my own experience as a refugee uh, and, and during the war. Uh, so, Finally, at the urging of my wife and my, one of my sons and one of my cousins, um, uh, I confronted my father's manuscript, on, which was a carbon, a, a fraying carbon, I don't know whether you all remember, the old carbon paper, yellow, um, that crumbled uh, with over age. Anyway, I had avoided even looking at it for many, many years. Uh, they persuaded me to look at it at least. And then to essentially, I, I, I looked at it and I thought, well, maybe I should do something. And I started to translate it. And, and, uh, and so I combined my own memoir with my father's. Um, and that was published about three, four years ago. Um, and so uh, I've been involved now in this story for some time. And in, inevitably, that led me to Aufbau and to the, to the role that Aufbau played in our, genera in our ge generation of immigrants, as it did in Werner's, I think. Um, uh, and, and so I started looking at it, and, um, and, and, and I discovered that Aufbau was, in fact, not just an occasional weekly magazine, mostly in German, but not entirely. Occasionally, there was some English, uh, more and more over time. Um, but that Alpha was a portrait, a window uh, into a very uh, untypical generation of immigrants to America, different from the classic image of uh, your tired, huddled masses yearning to be free. Uh, this was a more cosmopolitan generation, a, uh, one that was somewhat more, edu well, more educated, had more skilled. Obviously, there are a lot of names uh, that became famous uh, that, 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 you, uh, that everybody's heard of. Uh, Einstein, Bruno Walter, Bertolt Brecht, Arnold Schoenberg, Peter Lorre, Thomas Mann, Franz Werfel, a whole long list of people. Who, but there were also, in fact, millions, thousands of uh, people who were more, with more modest backgrounds, who uh, were, were skilled, and they were skilled in more humble occupations, tailors, entertainers, um, uh, dentists, uh, nurses, a whole range of people uh, who were not famous, uh, and, who, and many of whom 
had actually had difficulty when they got here in reestablishing re their careers. That was, of course, particularly true for, for people like lawyers, uh, where the law in this country was entirely different from anything they'd been trained on. If you were a dentist, probably teeth were about the same in this country as they were in Europe. But, but if you were trained as a lawyer, uh, it was much tougher. And I knew personally, as a kid, I had friends. I had a friend in Queens when I was going to school, a classmate whose, whose father had been a lawyer in Munich and then was, but at that time was going door to door selling typewriter repairs. And, 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 and I may be selling typewriters too, but he was basically a door to door salesman. And, uh, and of course, very depressed uh, and a very sad uh, 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 person. Um, the, the, uh, uh, and of course, the people who are more skilled um, had a certain advantage. Um, and, and of course, there were people who were already well known who came here. Um, you know about all the Hollywood figures, and you know about the musicians and the artists, um, and they often find pla found places, uh, but 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 many did not. And as I said, the uh, Aufbau and Aufbau reflected everything in that generation of immigrants, uh, uh, from alien registration uh, to immigration and naturalization regulations conditions in Europe, the French internment camps, Nazi anti-Semitic anti uh, edicts, the war, Zionism, post-war restitution, uh, uh, many restitution issues. There were lawyers who advertised in Aufbau uh, uh, seeking to represent clients who wanted to reclaim their property or their rights or whatever. Um, so uh, uh, and Aufbau was uh, obviously instrumental in a lot of that. Um, but it also, uh, in addition, uh, was a great picture into the culture, into the popular culture. Uh, uh, cafes, restaurants, hotels in the Caskills, um, shul services, concerts, plays, books, marriages, births, deaths, uh, places to visit in New York. Um, the phone and subway systems, um, uh, pieces on US us usage, idioms, and phrases, a regular section called Say It in English. Uh, what is the meaning of tight-fisted? Tight, tight -fisted, or that idea didn't pan out. And political or economic terms, was ist ein Union Shop? Was ist New Deal? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there are a whole series of these things um, uh, on our political uh, uh, conventions and pra practices, the parting conventions, the nominating process, uh, which uh, must have seemed exotic to a great many immigrants, as it still does to some of us today. Aufbau um, um, also had a regular section on the West Coast, where a lot of uh, 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 entertainment figures from the, from the cinema uh, came. And there was actually, for a while, there was Hollywood offered uh, very small contracts to emigres um, uh, against the promise that that individual would participate some way. Um, many of them never fulfilled that obligation, but it was a way to bring you could get a, if you had a job, you could get a visa. So some people came over and got immigration visas um, because they were because they had a, a, a job in Hollywood. Um, anyway, um, and of course, uh, even more important, it was a hometown paper uh, to all those immigrants. Um, uh, and and uh, as you saw on uh, on on the pro projection on the screen. Um, it, it had lists of thousands of names of people looking for other people, uh, people in this country looking for loved ones abroad, uh, people who are still over elsewhere in Shanghai or South Africa or uh, 
uh, in North Africa, in the, in the Middle East, uh, 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 looking for relatives or for loved ones. Um, and after the war, of course, when the camps were liberated, there was an enormous outpouring of these uh, 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 being sought notices, um, uh, many by uh, camp survivors looking for people, loved ones overseas, and many from people in this country particularly look, hoping to find relatives who had been in the camps, hoping they were still alive. In most cases, of course, they were not, but uh, it was a way of, I think, getting some kind of closure uh, on, uh, on a terrible period. Um, through all of it, through all that, Aufbau's mission um, was basically uh, Americanization, uh, uh, and encouraging the Americanization of the, and in fact, for a while it even had a line over the, the, the front page saying for the Americanization of, of the immigrants, of the refugees. Um, and of course, some of that was also um, in concern that uh, against anti-Semites and critics who said these foreigners were taking our jobs and they were, they were not going to ever be Americans, which, by the way, is a thread in our hi immigration history that goes back to the beginning. Um, and uh, I'm, Benjamin Franklin, among others, in Pennsylvania before, this, before the revolution, uh, wrote pieces saying uh, he was afraid that um, uh, that with all these Germans coming to Pennsylvania, they would Germanize Pennsylvania rather than um, Pennsylvania Americanizing these immigrants. Um, and, uh, and then, so there were a lot of those kinds of worries. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, the Germans who came to Pennsylvania never did Germanize uh, Pennsylvania, um, and uh, any more than uh, the Muslims in the last 20 years imposed sh Sharia law on America. Um, but in any case, and Jefferson was worried that all the people from Europe, and particularly from France, um, who were used to monarchies, would never be able to be comfortable in a democracy, would ne never fit in, and that we would become a discordant mass of uh, 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 separated uh, uh, communities. Um, and, but anyway, in the process of the Americanization, um, uh, Aufbau ran a whole lot of uh, pieces about um, uh, how you get to be an American. And there were, there were some wonderful ads in Aufbau. There was an ad by a, a, a clothing store in Manhattan that said, Americanize yourself, also your wardrobe. And, 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 they were, and there was a lot of, and these were also consciously uh, advertised uh, 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 calls for uh, people to, uh, from, from gyms and, and swimming instructors or whatever to, that you had to learn to crawl because the breaststroke from Europe identified yourself as a European. <laughs> and so you had to learn the crawls to be American. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, there were a whole lot of these uh, uh, things. And of course, uh, uh, and of course, Aufbau was a great celebrant of American life and American culture. It ignored pretty much all the warts, some very bad warts, like the racism. Um, uh, did very little with that. Uh, pretty much ignored, at the beginning of the war, uh, the internment of the Japanese. And uh, there was some worry that Germans and, Itali and Italians would be, be interned like the Japanese. That, of course, never happened, although there was a very severe curfew for a while on the West Coast that, uh, that Germans could not uh, go out after 8 o'clock at night. Um, uh, and, and of course, you had to have your alien registration card. And that was, of course, an abiding question by German refugees. Hitler, of course, had declared all German, refu all German uh, immigrants, uh, uh, denaturalized them, so they were no longer Germans. But of course, 
in the in 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 the in the bureaucratic culture of of America, they were still enemy aliens, and they had to register as enemy aliens. And for a while, though that changed, uh, there was also there were also restrictions on what, 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 could enemy aliens get uh, war war production jobs and and and. And, 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 and serve in the military. That all changed quite quickly, uh, but it was an issue for a while. Um, as I say, there was this curfew on the West Coast, um, and it never made any sense, but, but in any case, there was a concern about that. Um, the, um, now, the, the book, of course, I began the book long before the 2016 election. So I didn't, I didn't have any of, any of that in, in mind when I started. Um, uh, and, and, um, uh, as it, I, and, and but, uh, but over time, of course, uh, the, the, the themes of this book began to kind of sort of it's coincide with contemporary themes in our uh, immigration debates. Um, uh, I should also say one other thing, by the way. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, let, me, let me say, getting the coinciding of themes. The, the, um, uh, the, immig the immigrants who came, the refugees who came, were very much aware, aware of the, the price and the, the the terrible things that nationalism could inflict, inflict on individuals. And so many of them, uh, over time, in my generation, became globalists um, fairly early on and supported uh, calls in Europe going back to the 1920s for some kind of um, uh, international uh, uh, institution, um, and 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 the um, uh, the, the, the uh, first, of course, a pan-European institution, and then a global institution. So there was a there was a great deal of consciousness of that, um, uh, and particularly as the war began, and of course, a great deal of that one way or another, reached fruition in the last 30 or 40 years with the EC. And now, of course, all of that, again, is under stress. Um, and it's very hard for me to comprehend what's going on. But uh, that's a whole other issue. But I do want to, um, I think, uh, end at least this short talk uh, with a reading from a, a passage from the end of the book if I may, because as I said, I started out, I, 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 never, I, I never thought about Donald Trump uh, when I started this book. Um, I didn't think about what would happen in the election, because I started, I started the book probably in 2014, something like that. Um, anyway, let me, let me read you just a little bit. Um, Uh, this is about the idea of a pan-Europe, a pan-Europe, and a pan-European Union, was f first furthered by a, a Hungarian uh, count and politician whose name I can't pronounce. Um, uh, anyway, Aufbau first took up the idea in 1940. In 1942, in the middle of the war, war Wilfred Hulse, who was a prominent contributor to Aufbau, and he was himself a physician, wrote about the need for the world's nations to yield some of their sovereignty to an international organization, first in Europe and then globally. It was the only way, he wrote, to end the burden of nationalism. It would be something entirely new and unprecedented and the only guarantee of peace in the world. Aufbau covered the campaign, the pan-European, campaign and the growing international support for a European Union more intensely in the years immediately following the war, both with staff-written pieces and with guest articles by people like FDR's 
former Interior Secretary Harold Ickes, always an alpha favorite. It was, it was tragic, Einstein wrote in his message to Aufbau's memorial service for FDR after the president's death in, 19, in 1945 that he wasn't able to engage his unique abilities in the solution of the problems of international security and tragic, especially for us Jews, that this man with his acute sense of justice did not live long enough for the decisive negotiations that would determine uh, the future for our, sore, our sorely tested people. And of course, that was written before Israel was established, but not long before. When the first meeting of the UN took place in 1946, Manfred George, who was the editor, endorsed the hope that eventually it would evolve from a League of Sovereign States into a world government. A European war Union was the first big step. Given their experience in the 1930s and 40s, a great many Hitler refugees were taken with the idea. This was the best way to prevent any recurrence of German aggression, the best way to prevent yet another 1940, 1940 and another 1939, and very likely the likeliest resolution of the refugees' ambivalence about identity, the way not to be a German, either present or former, West or East, and to celebrate your historic tour was to be or have been a European. Pan-Europe promised to do away with many of the horrors associated with the pre-war period, the terror of national borders and the layers of officialness and documentation associated with them, the passports and visas, the douanier, uh, the stops at every frontier post, the inspection of baggage, eventually maybe even the need the end uh, to, to end uh, uh, the need to change Franks, French, Belgian, Luxembourg into Deutschmarks or Lira into Gilder in entering every new country. That, that the last was, as it was finally established, a single currency without the f fiscal institutions to manage it might become a dubiously and possibly dangerous excessive economic indulgence. And it, and, and it did, but it didn't dampen the enthusiasm of the European leaders that led to it. Quote, Europe with its military customs officials and passport scrutinizers, Thomas Mann had written during a brief vacation in Holland in 1939, seems to us narrow, overcrowded, and ill-tempered. What was certain is that even as they were Americanized and assimilated into American life, uh, with words of a contemporary, a speed and thoroughness unparalleled in the history of immigration, the refugees and their children became voices both for a new cosmopolitan outlook in America and Europe and evidence of the terrible damage that xenophobias and provincialism could inflict. Because they were seamlessly part of so many things as Americans as Holocaust survivors, as former Europeans, as mainstays of the, of the Western culture that they helped bring to the New World, there is no way to isolate their impact from all the other things they are a part of. But there can hardly be much doubt that as much, that as, much as any prior generation of American immigrants, and perhaps more, they enlarged that New World, and often the Old World as, as well. For America, as for many other parts of the 20th, first neo-nationalist world, the world of ISIS, of Brexit, of Trump, Assad, Putin, Mugabe, Duterte, and the world's other despots, perhaps the most urgent hope is that the sensibilities and outlook that Hitler's refugees brought to the world and brought to the world and the lessons of their time will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Dr. Shira Cohn brings a unique perspective uh, to augment Mr. Schrag's emphasis on the German Jewish experience in America uh, by uh, casting light on the American Jewish experience at the same time 
uh, which uh, is a very different sort of perspective. So um, I think this is a, a wonderful way to, uh, to bring two different focuses to bear on, uh, on the issue of Aufbau and the community in particular uh, that it reached. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I just want to thank um, David and the Leobeck Institute for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel tonight and really to give me the opportunity to read Peter's wonderful book. And I just want to take a few minutes to share with you my introduction to the Aufbau, which was very late in coming, and also um, really build upon what Peter already shared about the world in which these refugees lived. And also, I would say how remarkable it is that the Aufbau was founded and nurtured at all, given some of the obstacles that really faced these refugees as they came to the United States and really tried to rebuild or build a life here. So as um, David mentioned earlier, I'm an American Jewish historian by training and really looking mostly at the post-war experience. But while I was researching Jewish college fraternities and sororities for my doctoral work, I came upon a really interesting story. In the 1930s, it turned out that several of these Jewish college fraternities, which could be found at universities throughout the United States and the sororities, these women's groups, actually created programs to help German Jewish refugee students and ended up bringing over a couple of hundred, um, in this case, male students to continue their studies at American universities, giving them free tuition and having them stay with room and board paid for by the fraternities. And that is a story I'd never heard before. And I decided to kind of make a little note to myself that I should follow up at some point in time on this. So when the dissertation was done, I decided to go back to this pre-war story and find out more about these German Jewish refugees who were really seen as some of Europe's brightest, already starting their studies in Central Euro European universities, only to have their studies curtailed with the rise of Nazism. And I wanted to find out why these students were brought over and what they did once they came to the United States. And so I found, actually, that even though visas were extremely hard to come by, even by the mid-1930s, after the rise of Hitler, if you were a male university student who was coming to the United States to continue your studies, you actually could get outside the quota system. And this was one of the very few ways American Jews were able to work with university administrators and also individuals within the State Department which were really no friends of Jews at the time, to bring people over. And this was really the key to a successful program. Now, the Jewish women's sorority saw what the men were doing and said, well, we would love to do that too, but we're smaller operations. We really don't think we know how to find female university students. The money should go to the men. So maybe what we'll do is find promising young women who already are refugees in the United States who would like to go to university and pay for their room and board by staying at sororities at some of these schools. So in the research, I ended up doing an oral history with a woman whose sister was one of the beneficiaries of these sorority scholarships. And in our conversation, she said that there was one thing that was life-changing to her sister. That as she was sitting around her table with her family in New York City after having escaped Stuttgart in the mid-1930s, her mother pointed to an advertisement in this paper that was a community paper, and she said the name was Aufbau. And she said that this little advertisement said that for interested girls who wanted to continue their studies, they should write a letter to this office, and they could perhaps be sent somewhere in the country, especially if they were interested in math and science. So Gedula Einstein, the woman whose sister I was speaking to, I was able to actually trace her journey from reading this advertisement to being hooked up with a sorority to being sent to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, where she stayed for two years as she completed studies to help her father, who was a doctor who ended up doing medical supply business work once he relocated to the United States. And not only was Gedula Einstein able, because of this one advertisement, able to complete her own studies, she actually created a network at the University of Illinois and was able to bring over at least one more student, a male student from her hometown of Stuttgart, and actually helped to fund his studies at the University of Illinois. So not only was the Aufbau really a catalyst for her own life being changed, but she actually saved at least one other life because of what happened to her and because of what this newspaper facilitated. 
And if there's one thing I really learned by reading Peter's book and also seeing the off bow with my own eyes, it's every single word in this newspaper had meaning to those who encountered it. And I'm sure many of you are sitting here tonight because of stories like this in your own families or things that you've heard about by reading more about American Jewish history or German Jewish history. So I want to speak about not really the refugees that I study specifically, but the broader context of these Central European, especially these German Jewish refugees who came over in the 1930s and when they could in the 1940s, even after the war had begun. So as Peter already noted in his remarks tonight and certainly in his book, it was a hard journey to get to the United States. Many of you already know that in the 1920s, especially in 1924, there was legislation for the first time that really curtailed European immigration to the United States for the first time. And the very countries who saw drastic cuts in the number of visas allowed ended up being those very same countries where their Jewish populations tried fleeing just a few years later. Technically, if you looked on paper, people from Germany were allowed 27,000 visas per year. That seems like a decent number. Only in 1939 did they actually meet that number of visas given out. Even in 1940, they didn't quite hit that number. And every single year, from 1933 on, there were new obstacles documented in the Aufbau, among other places, for what Jews trying to flee Germany and later on Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Eastern European countries, other places in Europe, changed, sometimes by the week. In 1940, they actually conducted a survey with the census. It showed in the United States, 1.2 million people were born in Germany, who were then in America. And this is Germans from all different backgrounds. Another 5 million Americans claimed two parents born in Germany. Another 6 million claimed at least one parent born in Germany. So we are talking on the eve of World War II, a population of at least 12 million people who had a foreign-born German member of their family in their household, or near and dear to them. And so when we think about the Aufbau and how it was operating, especially by the outbreak of World War II, it's pretty remarkable to think about the anxiety and the fear and the tension that these people were experiencing and their determination to put out news to the readership that they wanted to make sure the readers were abreast about American acculturation, about the news in Germany, because they still very much cared as to what was happening there, and also different variations of what Jewishness meant to their readership, whether it was through Zionism, through Jewish practice, or more secular cosmopolitanism that you referred to, whether maybe it's in the Jewish restaurants on the Upper West Side, or perhaps a speaking club or a social club they wanted membership in that advertisements were for. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight, but certainly in the 1930s and 40s, the readers of the Aufbau and those invited to read or edit the articles in it didn't. So as Peter mentioned, they were considered enemy aliens, sometimes legally. And again, we're talking about up to 12 million people in the United States. And many historians say that the only reason German Americans, including these Jewish refugees, were not actually subjected to more internment about 11,000 citizens of German background were interned during the years of World War II, compared to over 100,000 Americans of Japanese descent. The reason was citizenship. That historically, Germans were considered white. European immigration was OK. Even after 1924, in certain limited numbers, it was still permissible. And so Germans, like other European immigrants, when they could, flocked to obtain American citizenship. They wanted to demonstrate how they were good Americans. And basically, the United States government determined by the outbreak of World War II that it was going to be absolutely way too difficult to try to trace, track, and intern any significant number of this population. So it's interesting to keep in mind. So we know that, that, we know that now. They didn't necessarily know that at the time. They saw what was unfolding and knew that something similar could happen to them at any given point in time. Yet they still determined that it was that much more important to get the news out to the readerships to track what was happening and to show that they cared about their community. And of course, as Peter alluded to, we have to talk about anti-Semitism in particular during this time. 
As some of you may know, the first Gallup poll actually traced American attitudes towards Jews, who were one of the least liked groups at the time, usually ranking only above African Americans. Whether it came to questions about social relationships, whether you would hire a Jewish person, and certainly whether or not you thought there should be increased Jewish immigration to the United States, even when the war broke out. They had a lot going against them in American public opinion. Yet still, they persevered, and organizations or periodicals like the Offbow persevered in making sure people knew what was happening and that they had, as you said, a home base, a place that they could really go to feel like they were still very much part of the community. Lastly, I would just like to say briefly that one of the things that I find fascinating is that if you're a student of American history and you want to study the German experience, you tend to study the 19th century, maybe earlier. But prominent, study, prominent scholars of the American ethnic experience when thinking about Germans basically look at the 19th century, look at the waves of immigrants that came over then, whether Jewish, Protestant, or Catholic, and say basically by World War I, the Germans were American. They had been there for at least one generation, and certainly when World War I broke out, they really wanted to demonstrate their own good Americanism. They didn't want to be seen as Germans, since Germans were, of course, the adversaries of the Americans once America got in the war, but even before the official entry into the war. But the Aufbau and looking at the people who contributed to it actually tells a different story. The German story didn't end in America in a significant way in 1914 or 1918. We see 150,000 people coming over, probably more if we're thinking about illegal channels, and contributing to society. So the Aufbau, and I think Peter's book really gives us a fabulous launching point for this, gives us so many new threads to follow for trying to trace the German experience in America and how it really changed over time and its rich legacy. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. If there may have been 100 to 150,000 people, um, and yet each of those stories is different. Um, well, that's one of the fascinating aspects of this whole phenomenon, that we tend to see the aggregate of German Jews coming into the United States in considerable numbers, though too few, uh, but with each uh, a process of acculturation, of professional adjustment, of education, of acceptance, assimilation, or retention of traditional values that, uh, that's a little bit different. And uh, I, I was really reminded of that in Peter's original comments about when we first knew each other in 1955 and his sense that he wanted to conceal um, his, his origins and be a regular American guy. And uh, he succeeded. I had no idea until we were in contact a few years ago uh, that Peter was a German refugee like me. Um, and that, in fact, when he was an undergraduate at Amherst, he had not yet gone through the naturalization process. I pointed out to him that he was a foreign student when he was at Amherst, and he viewed this with, uh, with shock uh, when I made this point. My own naturalization took place um, in 1945 at the age of eight, and I couldn't sign my name to the appropriate documents. I could only make an X. And so um, that was uh, when I went up before the judge in Philadelphia, who seemed to have no particular anxieties about uh, my, uh, the risk of my Germanizing Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> he asked me if I'd ever served in the army of a foreign power, <laughs> engaged in prostitution, or any, a number of other questions for the benefit of a large audience of refugees who were achieving their citizenship and getting their second papers on that day. Um, it, was, it was an extraordinary moment to, uh, to receive that document, especially uh, having uh, come across uh, on my mother's passport uh, with uh, the, big, uh, uh, the big J stamped on it and the middle name of Sarah, which had been given to her by, uh, by the German government of the time. So um, th th these stories are infinitely varied and very, very interesting. Uh, but what Peter has done is to use the Aufbau as a vehicle for uh, illuminating 
the, uh, the personality of, a, uh, of, of an aggregate German Jewish culture, primarily in New York, but I think by extension you can find this, as you pointed out with California, all over the country, in Chicago, in Skokie, Illinois, in all the big cities, and, uh, and also in, in rural areas like Vineland, New Jersey, uh, where German Jews ended up as chicken farmers um, and uh, uh, where there was an opportunity for them. So um, uh, let's spend a little time just talking about that set of relationships of an immigrant population coming together with, uh, with an, a pre-existing American Jewish and non-Jewish population. And I was extremely struck by the, uh, your discovery of the role of Jewish fraternities and sororities um, uh, because this is a time, of course, when it's extremely difficult for American Jews to reach out to the refugees. And uh, I don't think anybody knows besides you, uh, <laughs> this story. So I, I, I trust we'll be hearing more about it in, in due course. But uh, why do you think they were able to do this? Is it because they were in a privileged environment of uni certain universities? Some universities were not, would not have been so receptive. It's a great question. Um, I would say that I think the only reason this program was so successful is because it was just that, a very small program. So these are people that were certainly elites. If you are a member of a Jewish college fraternity or sorority, especially an alumni leader of these institutions, at that point, you'd probably been in America for at least one generation. You had um, some kind of socioeconomic mobility or comfort to be able to pay for membership in such a society, to pay for the extras that would come along with the social experience for this. Um, and also, interestingly, you had to have the bargaining ability to really work with these outside administrators and certainly government officials for every single visa you tried to have. Um, as one tiny example, I read about um, this industrious boy who came over. Um, he read in the New York Times an advertisement for the fraternity program, wrote the fraternity directly, and basically was able to get to Pittsburgh to a fraternity chapter there. However, he came on a student visa. It was supposed to expire after a year. The fraternity had no idea what to do because they knew by that point they couldn't send him back to Germany to see what happened. <laughs> and so they actually have, um, and the correspondence is actually upstairs between a variety of fraternity leaders and officials. They had to sneak him over the border to Canada for 24 hours and make sure he came back over the next day um, after getting a meal and a hotel for the night under a Canadian student visa. And just all the negotiations that had to happen, you couldn't do that without having, as you mentioned earlier, American legal experience. You had to know what the law was and how to kind of bend the law a little bit to make sure it worked for you. You had to know, um, and really, most of it was absolutely above board. Um, but the idea that you had to know kind of how to work certain officials, how to go through certain channels, um, how to categorize your student to make sure it was a good thing for the university to have international students. Um, I would even say, if you want to spend a couple of hours, the archives up here, Albert Einstein himself actually intervened on behalf of a couple of his students who he wanted to have brought over from Europe under fraternity auspices. Um, even as late as 1940. So it's really impressive to see the variety of individuals who are committed to these efforts, most of whom were not necessarily prominent, certainly of Einstein's stature, but who had some means and really the determination to do some small piece of rescuing some segment of European Jewry. But of course, in, in talking about fraternities and sororities, um, they, even if you were part of that, that sort of elite, you still could not get a job in most law firms. Mm -hmm. You could not get, a, get into medical school. You could uh, not rent an apartment in Forest Hills uh, in Queens. Um, uh, it, I mean, so they, there was this enormous social bed of anti-Semitism. And of course, the other thing, and I think you touched on it, is that even with the tight uh, uh, quota laws, immigration quota laws, uh, the State Department was still riddled with anti-Semites and so never admitted anywhere near the number of people, Jews, who were uh, in theory allowed under the quota laws. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
So that, there was that sort of thing that, and the interesting thing about alpha is it doesn't really touch on most of that stuff. It avoids it. It is so committed to cheering on America and Americanization that it doesn't really touch much about any of the, the, the warts and, or, or the American racism until after the war, until it became more, more blatant, or at least it became more blatant to Alf Bauer's editors. Um, but, 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 it, but, but Alf Bauer itself um, didn't really go, go into that very much. And, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, and that, that, as I say, their mission was to talk up America. And of course, compared to Nazi Germany, it was like night and day, but it was not without warts. Peter, did Aufbau cover the university scene at all? Did it take any interest in what was going on? Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, and there were a couple of, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they talked about uh, 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 anti quotas in universities, for example, uh, or in medical schools. Um, and I don't recall anything like that. And that may have been something that I missed. Uh, and obviously, reading 40 years of Aufbau every week, every page, you miss a few things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, I, but, and, and you can all go through the book very carefully. If you find, or go through Aufbau very carefully, if you find something, let me know. <laughs> but but, but, but I, I think they were very, very careful to be, and of course, they loved FDR. I mean, FDR was, was, was like a god to Aufbau, even though FDR, of course, didn't do very much to ease the immigration numbers um, and had his own, had some good reasons for that. Uh, but but, um, but they, they never, they never rem reminded a FDR, how about all those Jewish uh, refugees who are still sitting in Marseille or Lisbon or God knows where in North Africa. How, how, what are you going to do about them? So no, I don't. I I don't know of anything like that. In, I actually have a question for you because you grew up with your familial knowledge and association with the Aufbaus. When you actually started reading these forty years worth of pages, <laughs> do you remember a time when you were reading that? Oh. I don't know, that's how they felt about that. <laughs> um, I, um, I mean, keep in mind that when, when Alf Bau came into the house, usually my mother brought it in, um, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I didn't want to read it, I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want it to be known that I spoke German. Um, and there was all that worry about, I mean, at first my mother still wanted me to wear short pants. Um, when I was whatever nine, ten, ten years old, and and that struck me as being some kind of European, German something. Uh, I don't think I ever had later Rosen, but but anyway, uh, but 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 uh, but I didn't want to have anything to do with anything German, anything refugee. Um, that all, and and it wasn't just that I wanted to be super American, which I did. Uh, but also because somehow refugee had some uh, overtone of weakness, of, of, of being a victim. Uh, I think somewhere Hannah Aaron talks, 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 touches on that. Uh, I can't remember now exactly where, uh, but, but she, she has, has a very good piece about being a refugee in a Jew then Jewish journal called the Menorah Journal. Um, and uh, which was published, I think, in New York. But, uh, and I think she touches on that. And of course, she also makes it clear that, and I, I, again, it's, it's something she writes about several times in Aufbau, that if you were, if, it were, if, if there wasn't a Jewish state, uh, and this was, of course, before Israel was established, um, you, uh, Jews had no had no rights as citizens, and basically they were they were easy to be victimized if you didn't have a 
country that they belong to. So, uh, and, and, and she wrote about that a number of times. Um, but, uh, but, but, but as I said, my worry, my personal worry was of not being identified as a refugee. And you, as you know. <laughs> well, I was just thinking as you, as you uh, made those comments about having read as uh, probably a 10-year-old in, uh, in the 40s a book by George and Helen Papashvili called How to Be an Alien. And it was a very, very funny book. And I think it, it made its rounds in the refugee circles that, that I knew about um, because we were at now and then actually able to laugh at ourselves for the, for the various m m mistakes we were making, the kind of faux pas and the, and the funny um, differences in accents and so forth. And, uh, and it was nice to know that uh, that people from um, other places and with other backgrounds were going through the same kinds of experiences. Uh, what I want to ask you now is, uh, from your differing perspectives, I, um, I, we'll, we'll start with Peter, having opened up this subject of Aufbau and the richness of its documentation and what it has to offer, um, what opportunities do you see for future research based on this and and, uh, and perhaps related sources that are at LBI and perhaps in other repositories. Where do we go in continuing to build on what you have done? That's a good question, Werner. Um, uh, uh, obviously, there's still a lot of uh, things to uh, unearth, both within Alpha and, and elsewhere. And as I said, this place, LBI, is so rich in resources. Uh, and in uh, letters and diaries and all kinds of documents um, uh, of personal stories and, and, and histories. And one of the things that uh, I think I find interesting is, uh, and obviously some of you are part of this story, um, is to what extent, and as we know, in this country, if you were an immigrant and, a, and um, you worked as hard as you could to be American. And then some people in the third generation would begin again to look back and see, look at their heritage and their forebears. Um, and it seems to me uh, this is now, now we have the, I guess, the third generation of, of uh, 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 descendants of immigrants. Um, uh, of, of my generation of immigrants. Um, I mean, I now have grandchildren, uh, and, and they're mostly now in their teens, and one, one in, their, in their 20s. But, but, but uh, so far, they have not shown much interest in that background. But I don't know whether that's true of the majority of kids of, 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 of of refugees or of immigrants. Um, and Will Herbert, years ago, wrote a book called Protestant Catholic Jew, which was about, in which he talks about the third generation beginning to look back again at it, its parent, grandparents' generation. Um, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. I'm not sure, because so many other things have changed. Um, and so, uh, and obviously, right now, the whole issue of ethnicity has, has overwhelmed the area. I mean, I mean, to, to be, to, I mean, obviously, you can be Jew, very Jewish and very American. But I'm not sure that um, the ethnic issue for Jews is the same as it was. Um, um, and obviously, there's still anti-Semitism and sometimes fostered at high levels. Um, but, but I don't know whether there is the same ethnic issue for Jews as there was in the 1940s. Um, and when, as I said, a, a great deal of American society was still very anti-Semitic. And, 
And now there's still some of that, maybe more than, than, than we know and that we fear, uh, but probably not like it was in the 40s. Thank you. Shira, do you see directions for future research? Mm. I'm actually excited for so many different directions, and I'm kind of jealous that I can't take them all on myself. <laughs> um, you know, I think, and so much of this, I think you offer as jumping off points in your book. I think looking at the OFBA, whether scholar or layperson, there are so many different channels and leads to pursue. Um, topics for, for example, how did the German Jewish refugee community see itself vis-a-vis -vis other immigrant groups or other ethnic minorities or religious minorities? You get into that at various times throughout your book, and I think it would be fascinating to delve into, for example, um, you know, refugees from the Korean and the Vietnam Wars. Um, you certainly have a really fascinating section as to Jewish-Black relations, especially in the post-war period. Um, this is really an untapped resource to tell us more about how a, a substantial Jewish community over the course of a period of time um, really saw itself in relation to other different kinds of Americans. Um, and I think would offer us something really interesting. Um, for example, there's a lot of scholarship on the Yiddish daily forward and how that sort of changed over time and how its readership might have thought about different communities. The author tells a very similar yet different story. I think that's really worth investigating. One of the other things that really jumped out at me through your book that I would love to see with the rise of digital humanities is literally mapping out the off-bow readership. Where are the readers in the 1930s? There is some wonderful um, work that's being done by scholars in universities and centers um, throughout the United States and beyond, really making compelling discoveries about what diversity of readership meant. What did it mean that one issue, as you mentioned in your book, of the off that was probably read by 30 different people at various mm -hmm. points in time? That may have been an exaggeration, by the way. But or <laughs> under-exaggeration. <laughs> uh, How does that change the map of Jewish readership and people who cared about these issues? There's so much interesting work done. And to your personal point, genealogy. There is a huge interest in people's genealogy these days, especially among younger people especially as records become more and more available. My German is not good. There's someone in this audience who probably attests to that. Um, but with the digitization, if you know a family name, if you've heard about maybe a hotel that your family went to or owned, if you've heard about a restaurant or a dish perhaps that someone used to cook, you can sit down with a family member who has this association to the off-bow or by yourself and actually search it in the comforts of your own home, which is pretty remarkable. So I think in terms of really connecting new generations with the material, with that experience of this community, the possibilities are really endless. And it would be wonderful to see people really, you know, take that and run with it. I would say my last comment is actually to what David mentioned earlier. There was a fantastic project on social media this past year, the 1938 project, um, which as David mentioned, took a different source every day to sort of document the German Jewish experience over the course of a year. I was actually able to bring that into my classroom. And students who are so conversed with social media were shocked you could actually use historical materials to create a narrative online. They were hooked. Another great example of this, if people are familiar with the St. Louis Twitter account, documenting all of the people who were on the, I believe, 1930 ship at St. Louis, which was turned around right outside of Miami and sent back to Europe, where most of the people on it perished. There is a fantastic fantastic Twitter account that actually traces each individual and what happened to them. And every single year on the anniversary of the St. Louis or if there's new immigration legislation, it goes on a rotation for 24 hours of introducing all their stories. The off-bow is nothing if not stories of a community. So there are so many different ways I think this could be translated into a social media audience. One, one of the things that struck me uh, when I was doing the research is how many Jewish refugees became chicken farmers, uh, which, you know, I mean, that was, uh, that was total news to me in New Jersey, in California. Um, and of course, the other, I mean, and there was great effort made by a number of immigrant organizations to dis disperse the, the refugees so they weren't all concentrated on West 72nd Street uh, uh, and, and, uh, or 81st Street, whatever. Uh, Thank you, but, Peter. Before we count our chickens, 
I would, I would like to uh, open the floor to discussion okay. and uh, questions. Uh, please try to keep your comments uh, as, as concise as possible so as many people as we can can, can be fitted in. Yes. Sure. Thank you. I actually love to talk to her afterwards about her mother's yeah. story. I would like to. There's a question in the back. Nope. Sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, I lived in Bogota, Colombia in the late 1940s after eight years in Shanghai. And even there, we had a subscription to the Aufbau which we got every week, and which I, as a teenager, read religiously, especially the sports. And I have to say that it helped me to convince to come to the United States in the 1950s. And uh, by the way, I loved your book. I already read it. Good. Excuse me. Yes, you, with your hand up. Okay. Oh. Um, Didn't quite hear the end of your question. Uh, who, whose interest the newspaper represented mostly? The uptown Jews or downtown Jews? It's, the question is, there were uptown Jews and downtown Jews. Uh, Which uh, among the German Jews, whose interest was most reflected in <laughs> Alpha? <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know um, of course, that aside from Aufbau, there, of course, there was the, the older Jewish community in this, con in this country, most of whom came in the 80s and 90s of the 19th century, um, and who were not comfortable by these, these new arrivals, um, mainly because they were afraid they would generate more anti-Semitism in their, in their presence. And of course, the same thing had happened to that generation 30 years when, when they arrived, because the then American Jews, who had been here since the 1840s, mostly since the 48 revolutions, were uncomfortable about all these Eastern European Jews generating more anti Semitism. Those were, of course, the established, uh, the names you know, you know, the, uh, uh, the bankers and the newspaper publishers and so on. And they were afraid that these shtetl Jews were going to uh, generate all kinds of anti-Semitism. So it's, and this is, and now f f 
put, it's now, I think now I have a sense that that whole distinction has pretty much vanished. I don't think, I don't think there's a distinction anymore between the, the Jews of the 1880s and 1890s and the Jews of the 1940s. Could we call it maybe that the Ostbau editors were perhaps big tent German refugee advocates and that they were speaking primarily to their own people, representing their own people? But any Jew anywhere who wanted to take something away from the Ostbau was certainly invited to read and absorb anything. But I certainly agree with you that really those distinctions um, had kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, but I think also to the earlier point, the quote unquote uptown Jews, those Jews who really had amassed wealth and some power by the 1930s, did see these rivals as at best maybe a mitzvah project, as you said. And you know, Eastern European Jews, many of whom were themselves immigrants or certainly children of immigrants by the 1930s, they were scared for their own families still back in Europe and what was going to happen to them. So I would say that it wasn't always tension between those groups, but there was so much fear and indecision and anxiety, they didn't know how to even help each other. And they, there were actually also two, gender, two, two waves of um, immigrants from Europe before the war, mostly German Jews, and after the war, who tended to be mostly Eastern European Jews who had been interned and were survivors from the camps and, and were, again, culturally, Sim more similar to the prior generation than they were to the German Jews. Yeah, I'd make uh, two comments in, in, uh, with respect to that. Uh, one is that Uptown Jews doesn't really recognize the reality of the demographics of the German Jewish immigration because um, it doesn't include Washington Heights um, and the Upper West Side, which was really Frankfurt on the Hudson. And, uh, and the fact that, uh, that there was this large population, uh, which we don't really think of in terms of our crowd um, is, uh, is very, very important. The second is uh, with respect to your allusion to um, Eastern European Jews and the forward and so forth, um, the wonderful thing is that we're all here in the Center for Jewish History. We have YIVO, we have LBI, we have other Jewish organizations. Um, and having been uh, a small part of the process by which that came to be, I can tell you that from an, an initial suspicion and sense of reservation, um, a feeling we were kind of herding cats, to, to, to suddenly have everyone uh, working together in this institution is, I think, not only a great achievement, but a reflection of, uh, of, of uh, of how far we've come as, uh, 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 as a society in working through and advancing beyond those issues. Other? Yes. but I remember it being on the table. It was a big deal, and I don't know any German, okay? Um, it seems to me that the, Af and that's why I'm here, because it was so important to my family. Um, it was the social media of the time. It yeah. really was. If you think about it in terms of what Facebook and Twitter and Instagram does for maybe our children's generation, um, my kids are 35 and 40, but they're a little even too old for that. But anyway, um, where, what about the photographs? You know, we've been talking about the words and um, <coughs> prose of uh, the Aufbau, but there must have been a lot of photographs. And I would imagine, of course, we don't have the originals of those, but the ones that are in print. I can't, I'm a retired librarian, so I, I, and I've worked upstairs a little bit in, in the library. I don't imagine that we have the original f photographs, but can any work, do you think, we're talking about the future, there's so much visual. And I, I would imagine, I don't know, that can't be digitized, you know, that that's a completely, di but in a completely different way of category. I just don't know. Can I talk about one of the photos in your book? Mm -hmm. Can I talk about one of the photos in your book sure. that I think it's is, about the speaks to this? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if the ahead. question is about the photographs um, in the Aufbau, I would say that one of my favorite things about reading Peter's book was actually the photographs that he does include and show. So I'm not sure about the originals either, but they're really, um, in terms of like what they've actually been able to digitize, the photographs are fantastic and I actually think very much tell 
a whole other story about this experience. And as one example that Peter includes in the volume, um, it's the photograph about the American soldier, the Jewish American soldier, where it's using what you called um, Jerglish. It's a combination in one photograph, the text underneath it had a combination of German and English. And you can literally in this photograph and the text accompanying it in Peter's book, see the negotiation of identities that this refugee community was going through, the pride of having one of their own in an American uniform fighting in World War II. The idea that not everyone really knew about you know, what that meant to have them in uniform, so there needed to be some German there too. So it's really a remarkable resource for photographs. And, and Althau, of course, ran a regular feature during the war called Our, Bo Our Boys in the Army, or Our, you know, Our Boys in the Army. And they were mostly in the Army. And of course, they weren't all boys, but many of them were. We'll take uh, one more question. Yes. Yeah. Bob Morgenthau, who died last month, went to Amherst. But his sister was blackballed at a sorority at Swarthmore. Now, her grandfather was an ambassador. The father was the Secretary of the Treasury. Maybe at that time, he was Forestry Commissioner of New York State. And the idea was the school took action. They banned sororities, fraternities. But what it talks about and shows is that those Pennsylvanian people, you know, the people on the ground, they had an attitude about Jews. Didn't matter how up you were, I mean, you know, in the government or anything, you're a Jew, we don't want you in our sorority. But me, maybe we have time for one more question, if yeah, someone has a question. Yeah. Sir, we're back. And then uh, there's time to continue the conversation outside, but we'll give you the, the second to last word. So as I think the only person under 40 here, I have a question alluding back also to the social media thing. Uh, how did anyone manage to track people down using the ads if they were in Europe? Did people in Europe receive the newspaper? Same question. How, um, so how, like the ads, looking for lost family members, trying to search for them, like, were they successful? Like, were, how would you yes, do that if yeah, you found yeah, someone? Yes, some were successful, and Alpha even, I shouldn't say crowed about that, but they, but, but, but I'm not sure how many were, and there were so many. I mean, as I said, uh, before the war, there were, of course, uh, people who'd just come over were looking for relatives who were elsewhere in the world. And you know, you had people in Shanghai running ads looking for relatives and last seen in, you know, and, and, and of course, uh, there were these very touching ads after the war of pe people looking for relatives, loved ones, which would say uh, of so-and-so of Mannheim, um, uh, last seen at, um, uh, Theresienstadt, and uh, does anybody know anything about the whereabouts of my aunt or whatever? Um, so there were many, many of those. I don't know how many of them, but they were. But there certainly were some that where people found other people. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say, by the way, which is somewhat off your question, is that there were even within the American refugee community. They were separate little enclaves of people from one part of Europe uh, and another part of Europe. And, and, and Aufbauer, I think, to some extent, brought them together. So they were, so the, the, the Viennese Jews, they, they was a separate, they, there was a separate name for them. They were not called Wiener or something. It was something else as opposed to German, German Jews, um, uh, who, and I can't remember now. The book, the book knows more than I do, I should tell, <laughs> should tell you. Um, the, the, um, but, 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 so there were all those separate little islands, and they had their own events. They had their own dances, and their own parties, and their own uh, sing for I and whatever. I do recall, and I think others in the audience will also uh, recall uh, people, and in this case, my parents, pouring over those lists each week as they came out in 1946 and 1947. And it was a needle in the haystack kind of thing. The odds of actually finding the person you were looking for 
or the people you were looking for uh, were, were vanishingly small. And yet we know anecdotally that this happened and that people were found and reconnected through this paper. Um, there were also other agencies that were attempting to put people back together in this fragmented world that, uh, that emerged after, uh, after uh, the, the war ended and the, and the Holocaust became uh, publicly known to, to everyone, um, like the International Red Cross, uh, which was able to identify um, the names of people who had been deported and so on and so forth. But your, your question uh, really goes to the sort of human nature of, of the refugees wanting to sort of, you know, reconnect with people who might or might not have been uh, located. One of the things that struck me, and I don't want to filibuster here, but one of the things that struck me is the extent to which now, uh, and obviously as a result of the whole Nazi era and so on, Germany itself has become perhaps the, the, the biggest, strongest outpost of, democratic, uh, of the democratic system of any place on Earth. And I used to say America, but it, I'm not so sure anymore. But, but in any case, um, uh, yeah, I, I, and of course, Germany also has its serious Nazi problems, but, but, but Germany has become kind of the, the, the strong pillar of democratic uh, belief. Right. Um, we sh should uh, end, and uh, uh, let me do so by Thank pointing you. out, Peter, that, that your book, in addition to the, the, the uh, inevitable sadness that it narrates, is, a, is really a, a bittersweet experience. And there are touches of nostalgia which make it a wonderful read. For example, I don't know whether you actually went to these places, but your evocation of the coffee shops and diners and sort of other Jewish institutions on the Upper West Side are absolutely wonderful. And uh, it certainly made me feel, as a person who spends time on the Upper West Side, uh, that we have lost a world uh, which was short-lived but was in many ways quite wonderful while it lasted. Thank you for doing that, and thank both of you for your wonderful input. Thank you, Werner. So.